Final Fantasy Mystic Quest on the Super Nintendo. Certainly quite an unorthodox Final Fantasy game. It was released in 1992, so it found itself sandwiched in between Final Fantasy IV, released in 91, and VI, which came out in 94. We here in the United States never got Final Fantasy V on the Super Nintendo, though we got 4 and 6, but they're retitled to 2 and 3. But I'm sure most of you know that already. It's old news. A little history behind Mystic Quest. The game was actually first released in North America. It's earned quite the reputation as being a light RPG, or a kid's version of Final Fantasy, and after playing it through myself, I would be hard pressed to argue. The purpose of making an easier version of such a well-known RPG game was to appeal to a more casual audience and to try to rope in newcomers by offering a less difficult title with some similar mechanics. Mystic Quest would later be released in Japan under the title of Final Fantasy USA Mystic Quest. You can think of it as the Super Mario Bros. 2 of the Final Fantasy series, in that Mario Bros. 2 wasn't the real Mario 2, but a different game entirely made for a less hardcore audience. But as far as I know, Mystic Quest isn't a reskin of another game like Mario 2 was, and Mario 2 was uh, based after a game called Doki Doki Panic, but I'm getting off topic here. The story is your typical run-of-the-mill fantasy game. Defeat monsters, restore light to the crystals, and save the world. You also get a lot of the classic Final Fantasy monsters, including behemoths, adamant turtles, and a dragon with at least two heads. The main character, whose name is Benjamin, but you can name him as you wish, is a lot more talkative than any Final Fantasy protagonist I've ever seen. Also, he literally has no idea what's going on when the game begins. Your village gets destroyed by an earthquake, and this old guy shows up before you and says, You slayed the monster, you're the hero of the prophecy! And Ben is like, For real? And the old dude says, Well, you killed the monster, so I guess you'll do. Benjamin also does a lot of shrugging. He's gotta be one of the most compliant heroes ever. The world needs saving, and you have a sword. Go kill this monster. Okay, sure. It's not like he's part of a group like the Warriors of Light, or a band of rebels out for revenge like Furion and company, or part of some ancient lineage like Link. He also has almost no development in the ways of a character. From what we can tell about his personality, he's pretty laid back, just eager to fight and have an adventure. I can't be too hard on him though. The original Warriors of Light had literally no personalities to them. They never even talked! Maybe Benjamin is the warrior class from the first game, or fighter from 8-bit theater. I like swords, let's kill monsters! Uh, then again, he could just be like most other protagonists. I got roped into this, and now let's go save the world. He's a pretty good guy. He has no obligation to help anybody. They asked for help, and he said yes. Also, fun fact, Benjamin also made an appearance in Theater Than Final Fantasy on the 3DS. So, kind of like how Birdo and Mario originated from a game that wasn't really Mario, they both now exist in their real series. As far as the gameplay goes, it feels like a combination of Final Fantasy 1 and Earthbound put together, in that you have the same command style as the first Final Fantasy with attacking, using items, and magic, and Earthbound in that your enemies are facing the screen instead of it being a side-to-side -side view. The dungeon and town view is similar to Final Fantasy 1, but also has a bit of a Legend of Zelda feeling. You can use your weapons to solve puzzles and traverse obstacles. The sword hits switches, the bomb blows open cracked walls and destroys certain obstacles, the axe cuts down trees, and the claw is used for climbing and grabbing onto faraway hook points, kind of like the hook shot. You can also jump over some objects, holes in the floor, and from platform to platform. Uh, that's something new to Final Fantasy at the time, because I don't recall seeing it, it being used in another game for a long time. Granted, I haven't played every Final Fantasy out there, but in terms of the 2D sprite games, I remember this mechanic being used. The world map is unlike any Final Fantasy game I've ever seen, it's a lot more reminiscent of Super Mario World in that it's not free roam and you don't have random encounters, but you move from level to level before entering them. How's the difficulty, though? On the whole, this is the easiest RPG I've ever run through. There are no random encounters, all the enemies are stationary, and they respawn after you leave the dungeon. So if you wanted to, you could grind on them endlessly. Also, every small treasure chest respawns, so you can get unlimited amount of items. There aren't many types of items, and some are worthless, while others are amazing. However, there's no description in the menu for what the items do, so you have to fiddle around with it to figure it out for yourself. The refresher item, which looks like a soda can, is absolutely worthless. It resets your stat changes. For example, if your enemy lowers your attack or defense, it will set it back to normal. This game is so easy that you'll never need this item. At first, I didn't even know what it did, I had to look it up on the web. Not enough enemies change your stats in a way that would require you to use the refresher, so it's just a waste of space. Cure potions and heal potions are pretty basic. Cure restores your HP, and heal cure status ailments. Not sure why the names aren't swapped though. Why is it that heal isn't the HP recovery item, and cure it isn't the status item? Don't you let wounds heal, and don't you cure sickness? Nah, but that's a running thing in the Final Fantasy universe. This isn't the first game to do that, and it won't be the last. The seeds are your ethers. They restore your magic uses. However, you don't have MP in this game, but you have three different types of magic, and each one has a set number of uses. This is convenient, because that means you can use a lot of attacking magic, and still have plenty of points left for healing spells. Now let's talk about the battle mechanics. As I said before, your enemies face downward instead of sideways. One thing that's convenient is that most enemies have an identifiable weakness. Plant-based and worm enemies are weak to the axe, and flying enemies like gargoyles and the various birds are weak to wind magic and shooting attacks, like the bow and the throwing stars. However, you won't always have the right weapon at the right time. Benjamin can only acquire four types of weapons. The sword, the axe, the bombs, and the claw. 
He can't get any of the shooting weapons, and the only two of your party members who will have them are Phoebe, she uses the bow, and Tristam uses throwing stars. These, as well as the bombs, have a limited number of uses, but there will always be treasure chests around with more shurikens or arrows for you to pick up. Your other party member will change at various points in the game. Yes, you only have two party members this time, whereas in most Final Fantasies, you have four. You can also set your second party member to automatic, or you can control them manually, and you can change Benjamin's weapon mid-battle with the L and R buttons, instead of having to wait until after the battle to do so, making it easier to attack either one enemy or multiple targets at once. The weapon you're using will be displayed on your heads-up display, along with your HP, which you can either have numbers, like in classic Final Fantasy, or you can have it in bars, kind of like Fire Emblem. Each of Benjamin's weapons has three stages of upgrade, each getting more and more powerful. However, only the bomb and claw upgrades will affect the overworld gameplay. The final bomb enhancement, the Mega Grenade, allows you to throw bombs from a distance. And no, you can't use this to attack enemies before a battle starts. That would have been nice though. Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories allowed it, so why not here? Be a trendsetter. I guess because the game was already so easy, they didn't want to make it too easy. And the last one with the claw is the Dragon Claw, which is the best weapon in the game. The first and second claw weapons are just good for climbing walls and for dealing average damage, but the Dragon Claw lets you grapple across holes if there's a hook you can catch onto, and in battle it can inflict nearly every status ailment in the game. It can cause poison, paralysis, confusion, blind, sleep, and even petrification, which is one hit kill if the enemy doesn't resist it. However, this doesn't mean that every hit from the weapon is a guaranteed kill. Its base attack without status effects is in the range of the 600s, so the final sword upgrade, the Excalibur, gives you more raw attack power. But with a chance of instant kills, it makes the sword obsolete. Bombs are great for hitting multiple enemies at once, which is really helpful early on in the game. However, you won't find yourself needing them as much as you approach the later stages. Well, except to deal with this one type of enemy who is weak to bombs and resists all magic! That guy's a dick. Speaking of magic, they kept it nice and simple. There are 12 spells in total, divided into three different types. White magic, used mostly for healing. Black magic, used for attacking. And wizard magic, which are more powerful attack spells. For white magic, we have exit, which is like teleport in other Final Fantasy games. It can get you out of a dungeon, or sometimes teleport an enemy away, which is an instant victory. Cure and Heal, they're the same as their potions. Cure restores life, and Heal cures status ailments. Cure can be cast on the whole party at once, and can also be used to deal damage against undead foes. Life is the best white magic spell. It not only brings your allies back to life, but also fully restores their HP, and cures most status effects as well. Your black magic spells are pretty standard. Blizzard, Fire, Arrow, and Quake. Quake is good for attacking grounded enemies. Unlike the earlier games, though, Quake isn't a one-hit kill. The rest are self-explanatory and are very powerful against certain enemies, while others may not be very effective against them. Your wizard magics are awesome. You get two of the classic Final Fantasy overkill spells, Meteor, which looks fantastic, and Flare, which is the strongest spell in the game. However, unlike Final Fantasy 1 and 2, Flare actually is fire elemented instead of just being a blast of light and heat, as it's described in Final Fantasy 1, and Meteor is earth-based. You also get two other spells. Thunder has been upgraded from just a black magic into a wizard magic, and another spell, simply called White, which I'm assuming is this world's version of Holy, is like the Super NES version of Final Fantasy IV where Holy was renamed White, due to censorship issues. That's dumb, stop being oversensitive, people. At least White sounds better than the NES version of Final Fantasy I's censored name for Holy, which is Fade. White at least makes some sense because it's big flash of white light. But that aside, White is your first OP spell. When you first get the spell, most enemies will die in one hit from it especially if you're fighting uh, two or fewer opponents. Flare's just recolored white as far as the sprites go. Now for the enemy roll call. We have a lot of generic fantasy enemies as well as some classic Final Fantasy opponents. We have evil frogs, vampires, mummies, tree monsters that are not Groot, behemoths, Medusa-like enemies, adamant turtles, skeleton dinosaurs, golems, dragons, giant worms, giant birdmen, and the Dark King. One thing I find very nice about this game is the aesthetics of the sprites. As your enemies take damage, their sprites change showing them getting angry or showing visible battle scarring so it gives you a sense of you're actually making progress if you can't see a life bar. The ninja enemies kind of make me sad though. They start crawling away into the ground as if they're trying to run away, but you're just like, nope, and kill them off. The Medusa enemies are funny because at first their snake hair gets angry and then they're bald. So I use this big battle axe to cut off their hair. Seems legit. Then we have the ghost inspector enemies, floating sheets straight out of a haunted house. They do that annoying thing where they can make copies of themselves. We've seen this in other games before. One example of this is the Devil Gundam in MS Saga New Dawn, even though that was a PS2 game and this is Super Nintendo. But you'll fight two Devil Gundams at Mount Trial. If you don't kill both of them fast enough, the survivor will create a copy of itself at full HP. Fortunately, if a Spectre copies itself, it's an exact copy, meaning that it will retain the damage it took and so you can wipe him out pretty quickly. 
However, even though there are no random encounters, enemies are stationary, but a lot of them can be invisible in dungeons. So it's kind of like at the end of Final Fantasy 1 when you're walking through the Chaos Shrine, you have to fight the four fiends. And every time you step on the panel, you'll fight them again. Now what are the dungeons like? Really, I'd have to say it's kind of like a combination of both Zelda and Final Fantasy style. You have a bone dungeon and ice pyramid, kind of like Skull Woods and the Ice Dungeon from A Link to the Past, and a giant tree, kind of like the Deku Tree from Ocarina of Time. But wait, this game came out six years before that. Big talking tree with the mustache. You have to go inside him to fight monsters to progress the story. Did Ocarina of Time rip that from Mystic Quest? You also have a volcano and a tall tower, reminiscent of Mount Golg and Castle Pandemonium from the first two Final Fantasy games. You can reach the tower by using a rainbow road. So does that mean this guy designs levels for Mario Kart? The bosses of each dungeon are fitting enough. For the bone dungeon, you have a giant skeletal T-Rex. In Ice Pyramid, you fight an Ice Golem. The volcano's boss is a two-headed dragon, and you fight a Birdman in the tower. This battle, and the rematch with his palace swap double later on, are the only times I ever found myself using the defend command, because he goes into this mode where he can deflect all of your attacks. When you get to the last dungeon, the Doom Castle, you have to go through four floors, each one based on the four crystal dungeons, and fight a palette swap of all the four crystal bosses, before you get to the top floor and face the Dark King. The Dark King is one of the most interesting parts about this game. Before the battle even starts, he reveals that the prophecy about Benjamin being some great hero was a lie, and then he's the one who spread that rumor. Well, talk about Spirit Breaker. That's, that's kind of harsh. But you put up with your fair share of crap and you come this far. Benjamin is a force to be reckoned with now. The Dark King starts off not so threateningly, but then he goes Gilgamesh on you and sprouts multiple arms, each one carrying a weapon. As you whittle him down, he eventually reveals his true form. A giant spider! KILL IT WITH FLARE! No, seriously, kill it with flare. That's your best strategy. And then after the spider takes enough damage, the legs break away to reveal tentacles. No, 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 no! Talk about nightmare fuel. If I had played this game when I was seven years old, that would have terrified me. Freaky face giant spider with the chance of I've seen enough hints I didn't know where this is going. Fortunately, this is his last form, and after you kill this unholy atrocity, you win! The old man who is giving you advice throughout the whole game is revealed to actually be the fifth crystal, the crystal of light. Afterwards, Benjamin basically says goodbye to all the main characters and sets sail for a new adventure, Tristam tagging along, and the credits roll. So in conclusion, if we take this as a separate entity, the game itself is actually really nice. It's a casual game, not really made for diehard RPG fans, and it's a good game for a beginner to cut their teeth on. The graphics are nice and colorful, and the music is kicking, but it sounds more like it belongs in Mega Man X or Contra instead of Final Fantasy. Want to hear some of this? I imagine that I should be running around uh, shooting things instead of battling evil frogs. Overall, I give it a 7 out of 10, but it doesn't quite hold up as well compared to the other Final Fantasies. This game is simply too easy for that standard. There are not a lot of puzzles to figure out, the grinding is simple because there are optional battle arenas that you can go to just for the sake of fighting enemies with a reward at the end, and all the best spells and weapons are just found laying around in the open. There are very few secrets and no side quests to do, and if you die, you don't have to go back to your last save, you can simply retry the battle. That does help because it gets frustrating having to try to find a save point, and I like being able to save anywhere, but at the time, that was kinda new. The original Final Fantasy on NES saved in the world map, if I'm not mistaken, and Final Fantasy IV had save points. Also, the in-battle difficulty is very finicky later on. You'll encounter multiple enemies at once that can cast one-hit kill moves like Doom and Petrify. If you get hit by this, you're incapacitated instantly and the game's over. This is especially frustrating when the Dark King uses this move two or three times in a row before you can heal, and he doesn't miss very often. But you're gonna find cheap deaths like this in other games too, like the War Mech in Final Fantasy I and the Kamikaze Ravens in MS Saga New Dawn but they did get a little carried away with it. There are even enemies as early as the second dungeon who can cast Petrify. One scenario that screwed me over my first time playing this game was when I got to the rope bridge before the life force. Your party gets knocked off the bridge and you have to fight alone. It's just one enemy, but you probably can't one-shot him on your own, and if he can petrify you, then it's an instant loss. Even though I can retry the battle immediately, it's still really frustrating. One of the last things I have to bring up is a glitch that affects two different parts of the game. This isn't in all copies of the game or ROMs, but it's in a lot of the earlier ones. It's in the levels Falls Basin and The Mines due to a glitch in the music track. If you fight an enemy, the game will freeze shortly after getting out of the battle. The music will stop, but you can still move, and then the game crashes. The same music is played in these two dungeons and in Spencer's Place, but Spencer's Place has no enemies, so you're safe. The way to get around this, save before and immediately after every battle, reset the console, repeat until you clear the dungeon, and never go back there again. 
So as I said, this is a great game for the SNES library. I'm not sure if it will be one of the timeless classics like the other Final Fantasies, but as a curiosity, or love Super Nintendo, or if you haven't played a Final Fantasy and know nothing about RPGs, I'd say this is a good place to start. It's on the Virtual Console if you can't find a hard copy, so I'd say it's definitely worth a playthrough. And I will definitely be playing through it again very soon.